churches. If we let come into being a secular church, which is shorn of traditional and divine values, where shall we go for inspiration in the crises of tomorrow? Can we appeal to the rightness of a specific regulation to sustain us in our hours of need? Will we be able to seek shelter under a First Amendment, which by then may have been twisted to favor irreligion? Will we be able to rely for counterforce on value education in school systems which are increasingly secularized? And if our governments and schools were to fail us, would we be able to fall back upon the institution of the family when so many secular movements seek to shred it? It may well be that as our time comes to suffer shame for his name, that some of that special stress will grow out of that portion of discipleship which involves citizenship. Remember, we are, as Nephi and Jacob said, to learn to endure the crosses of the world and yet to despise the shame of it. To go on clinging to the iron rod in spite of the mockery and scorn that flow at us from the multitudes in that great and spacious building seen by Father Lehi, which is the pride of the world, is to disregard the shame of the world. Parenthetically, why, really why, do the disbelievers who line that spacious building watch so intently what the believers are doing? Surely there must be other things for the scorners to do, unless deep within their seeming disinterest, there is interest. If the challenge of the secular church becomes very real, let us, as in all other human relationships, be principled but pleasant. Let us be perceptive without being pompous. Let us have integrity and not write checks with our tongues which our conduct cannot cash. Let us be humble and not try to magnify our calling by shrinking the calling of others. Before the ultimate victory of the forces of righteousness, some skirmishes will be lost. Even these, however, must leave a record so that the choices before the people were clear and let others do as they will in the face of prophetic counsel. There will also be times, happily, when a minor defeat seems probable, but others will step forward, having been rallied to rightness by what we do. We will know the joy on occasion of having awakened a slumbering majority of the decent people of all races and creeds, a majority which was till then unconscious of itself. Jesus said that when the fig trees put forth their leaves, summer is nigh. Thus warned that summer is upon us, let us not then complain of the heat. Have I come today, however, only to add one more to the already long list of special challenges faced by you and me? Not really. I have also come to say to you that God, who foresaw all challenges, has given to us a precious doctrine which can encourage us in meeting this and all other challenges. The doctrine of foreordination is one of the doctrinal roads least traveled by, yet it is clearly one in which there is underlined how very long and how perfectly God has loved us and known us with our individual needs and capacities. It is so powerful a doctrine, however, that isolated from other doctrines or mishandled, it can stoke the fires of fatalism, impact adversely upon our agency, cause us to focus on status rather than service, and carry us over into predestination. President Joseph Fielding Smith once warned, Quote, it is very evident from a thorough study of the gospel and the plan of salvation that a conclusion that those who accepted the Savior were predestined to be saved, no matter what the nature of their lives must be, are in error. Surely Paul never intended to convey such a thought. Paul, you'll recall, brothers and sisters, stressed running the life race the full distance. He did not intend a casual Christianity in which some had won the race even before the race had started. Yet though foreordination is a difficult doctrine, it has been given to us by the living God through living prophets for a purpose. It can actually increase our understanding of how crucial this mortal estate is, and it can encourage us in further good works. This precious doctrine can also help us to go the second mile because we are doubly called. In some ways, 
our second estate in relationship to our first estate is like agreeing in advance to surgery. Then the anesthetic of forgetfulness settles in upon us. Just as doctors do not de-anesthetize a patient in the midst of authorized surgery to ask him again if the surgery should be continued, so after divine tutoring, we agreed to come here and to submit ourselves to certain experiences. Of course, when we mortals try to comprehend rather than merely accept for ordination, the result is one in which finite minds futilely try to comprehend omniscience. A full understanding is impossible. We simply have to trust in what the Lord has told us. Knowing enough, however, to realize that we are not dealing with guarantees from God, but extra opportunities and heavier responsibilities. If those responsibilities are in some ways linked to past performance or to past capabilities, it should not surprise us. The Lord has said, there is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law on which it is predicated. This is an eternal law, brothers and sisters. It prevailed in the first estate as well as in the second. It should not disconcert us, therefore, that the Lord has indicated that he chose some individuals before they came here to carry out certain assignments. And hence, these individuals have been foreordained to those assignments. Foreordination is like any other blessing. It is a conditional bestowal subject to our faithfulness. Prophecies foreshadow events without determining the outcome because of a divine foreseeing of outcomes. So for ordination is a conditional bestowal of a role, a responsibility, or a blessing, which likewise foresees but does not fix the outcome. There have been those who have failed or who have been treasonous to their trust, such as David, Solomon, Judas. God foresaw the fall of David but was not the cause of it. It was David who saw Bathsheba from the balcony and sent for her. But neither was God surprised by such a sad development. God foresaw, but did not cause, Martin Harris's loss of certain pages of the translated Book of Mormon. God made plans to cope with that failure over 1,500 years before it was to occur. Thus, for ordination is clearly no excuse for fatalism or arrogance or the abuse of agency. It is not, however, a doctrine that can simply be ignored because it is difficult. Indeed, deep inside the hardest doctrines are some of the pearls of greatest price. The doctrine pertains not only to the foreordination of the prophets, but to each of us. God, in his precise assessment beforehand, as to those who will respond to the words of the Savior and the prophets is a part of that plan. From the Savior's own lips came these words, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Similarly, the Savior said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And further in this dispensation he declared, And ye are called to bring to pass the gathered mine elect for mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. This responsiveness could not have been gauged without divine foreknowledge concerning all of us mortals and our response one way or another to the gospel. God's foreknowledge is so perfect, it leaves the realm of prediction and enters the realm of prophecy. The foreseeing of those who would accept the gospel of mortality gladly and with alacrity is based upon their parallel responsiveness in the pre-mortal world. No wonder the Lord could say as he did to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Paul, when writing to the saints in Rome, said, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Paul also said of God that he hath chosen us in him before the foundation.